the Nobel Prize, the most prestigious award available in a number of esteemed fields – physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, economics, peace. Only the best of the best receive a nomination, and only the best of the best of the best actually win it. Being named a Nobel laureate is to firmly inscribe yourself in the history books. To enter the pantheon of the greatest contributors to humanity's thriving. To validate your achievements on the world stage. Winners receive an invitation to the extravagant Nobel banquet, held every December in Stockholm's breathtaking Blue Hall, which takes place shortly after the prize ceremony itself. Luminaries and past laureates alike, dressed in formal wear, enjoy a multi-course meal of the finest foods, and are serenaded by live performances. It stands to reason that many of them, caught up in the excitement of recognition after years of unyielding work, have not thought about the wider context of what they are participating in. Why has this strange ritual been going on for over a hundred years? Why do the world's brightest minds brave the cold Swedish winter for such an exclusive, indulgent celebration? Who was Alfred Nobel? So entrenched has the Nobel Prize become in our modern society that we rarely step back and consider the nature of this exercise. Despite all the good it has come to symbolize, the prize was undeniably born out of one man's destructively amassed fortune and egotistical impulse. Moreover, throughout its history, the prize has not done a stellar job of reliably rewarding the high ideals which it claims to promote. This complicated legacy, while often overlooked, is worth sharing. Alfred Nobel was a polarizing figure. A genius scientific mind, to be sure. Born in Stockholm in 1833, he excelled from an early age in all academic disciplines, especially chemistry. He would go on to study in France under the tutelage of several renowned chemists, before leaving the academy to put what he had learned to use as an inventor. By this, I mean he started experimenting with explosives. He quickly patented a detonator as well as the blasting cap. Most interesting to Nobel was the chemical nitroglycerin due to its immense incendiary potential. However, after the death of his younger brother Emile in a nitroglycerin factory accident, he started looking for alternatives. This led him to inventing dynamite in 1867, which revolutionized mining and building processes, replacing manual labor and the use of even more dangerous explosives. But Nobel could not stay away from the allure of nitroglycerin, eventually returning to it and after a long series of iterations, inventing ballastite. The primary application of this new substance? Military weaponry. Throughout his life, Nobel held 355 patents and became fluent in six languages. However, as he reached older age, many would look back and question the ends to which he applied his innumerable gifts. He amassed a fortune of nearly $300 million. Yes, part of this came from selling devices like dynamite, which helped accelerate industrial scale infrastructure projects. But much of it too came from producing weapons of war. By the time of his death, his businesses would be operating 90 armament factories throughout Europe. His inventions were instrumental in ushering in an unprecedentedly devastating era of modern warfare. Nobel, though, saw himself as an honorable man. The public, he would learn, did not. After the death of his brother Ludwig in 1888, several newspapers, in confusion, published obituaries for the still-living Alfred instead. Needless to say, these accounts were far from complimentary. One dubbed him the Merchant of Death, and congratulated him for becoming rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before. Horrified by this, Alfred realized history would not look back on him kindly. He needed to do something to change this, 
in whatever time he had left. On November 27, 1885, Alfred Nobel made his way to the Swedish club in Paris and set about writing the third revision of his will. He would set aside the majority of his wealth into a fund, the interest on which shall be annually distributed in the form of prizes to those who, during the preceding year, shall have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. A high ideal, all would agree, and certainly a subjective one. On a more granular level, Nobel would go about carefully selling his stock holdings so as to free up capital without tanking the share price of his businesses, and establishing the Nobel Foundation to oversee the yearly awarding of the prize. Voting on specific prizes would be handled by the specific Swedish institution most expert on the subject. For example, the Swedish Academy of Science would award physics and chemistry, the Caroline Institute in Stockholm, medicine, and so on. Upon his death just a year later in 1896, his young assistant Ragnar would take over the preparatory work. The first prizes were awarded in 1901. Nobel originally imagined only five prizes, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and economics. Conspicuously absent, now perhaps the most famous of all the prizes, the prize for peace. Wealthy, highly educated elderly gentleman seeks lady of mature age, versed in languages as secretary and supervisor of household. This is the text of the ad Alfred Nobel had placed in a newspaper nearly two decades before rewriting his will for the final time. A strange, if innocuous ad that, to nobody's knowledge at the time, would dramatically alter the legacy of the Nobel Prize. The woman who responded and accepted the position was an aristocratic Austrian by the name of Bertha von Suttner. A pacifist, she would eventually go on to become a prominent advocate for peace, publishing an influential novel and speaking at a number of international peace conferences. She would also play an integral role in establishing the International Court of Justice and become an active voice for disarmament in the run-up to the First World War. In 1876, though, all this lay ahead. Von Suttner only worked for Nobel for two years, but the two would go on to correspond by letter for a long while after, all the way up to Nobel's later years, when he undertook the effort of endowing the prizes. Her ideas surely influenced his thinking. Nobel, while claiming to be an advocate for peace, believed in the theory of the so-called balance of terror, or more familiarly nowadays, mutually assured destruction. If both sides had incredibly destructive weapons, then any conflict would spell doom for both, and so peace would result. Perhaps my factories will put an end to war sooner than your congresses, he wrote to von Suttner in 1891. On the day that two army corps can mutually annihilate each other in a second, all civilized nations will surely recoil with horror and disband their troops. A convenient, even lazy, explanation for an arms dealer. Von Suttner, on the other hand, believed peace was an active process, and it needed to be earned through the hard work of individuals. Moreover, progress in this area deserved recognition. This exchange would continue back and forth for several years. It eventually culminated when Nobel seemingly conceded to von Suttner's position, including in his will a section endowing a sixth prize, to the person who shall have done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. The Nobel Peace Prize Upon learning of the news, von Suttner wrote to Nobel, whether I am around then or not does not matter. What we have given, you and I, is going to live on. Von Suttner never cared much about her personal legacy. What mattered to her was achieving peace for generations to come and making the world a better place. Yet that she is largely forgotten, while Nobel remains well known, forms a cruel irony 
given which of the two more clearly embodied the prize's lofty ideals. In 1905, von Suttner would win the Nobel Peace Prize herself, though even that sadly remains a footnote in the history books. The Nobel Prize continues to fall short of its ambitious claim of rewarding those who have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. For one, the prize has a long track record of sexism. While a woman was instrumental in its founding, the Nobel has never fairly recognized women for their contributions to human progress. Across the six prizes, from 1901 to 2020, only an astoundingly low 58 of 934 winners have been women. Skeptics might suggest that historically, it is not merely the Nobel Prize, but society at large which has discriminated against women. Education and professional resources in these fields were limited to men, and so naturally women simply did not have the backgrounds to qualify for the award. Although it is certainly true that women have found themselves at a disadvantage in the relevant fields from the start, even if they did somehow break through, they found themselves ignored by the Nobel voters. Most famously, Rosalind Franklin missed out on the Nobel Prize despite the instrumental role of her data in the groundbreaking discovery of DNA. Francis Crick, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins, all three men, won the prize for this discovery in 1962. Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered pulsars in 1967, but never saw the prize. Her male supervisor, however, was recognized in her place for the finding in 1974. Microbiologist Esther Lederberg, physicist Chen Shengwu, the list goes on. In addition to its discrimination towards women, the prize has many times rewarded individuals who some would argue did more to harm society than to advance it. While each of these figures warrants their own detailed examination, the list of controversial prize winners includes Egas Moniz, Henry Kissinger, Fritz Haber, Abiy Ahmed, to name a few. No matter how you feel about these people, it's worth examining the fact that the Nobel has not once retroactively stripped away a prize. Never. Even an award as comparatively unimportant as the Heisman Trophy awarded to the top American college football player does that. All because a 20-something-year-old college kid accepted free flight tickets and cash from his agent while technically an amateur. Yet the man who invented the frontal lobotomy gets to keep his? It makes you wonder, what really is the Nobel Prize rewarding? And why is it so stuck in its ways? Surely, it remains as important as ever to recognize contributions to human progress. However, equally, we should deeply understand and question the origins and history of these rituals, and encourage them to change for the better. The Nobel Prize symbolizes greatness. But it has a long, long way to go until it becomes a great symbol.